Cardinal, whose real name is Zavera de Vries, and for the past two years has been operating houses of prostitution in New York City at various East Side locations, most recently on East 65th Street and East 55th Street. The houses that she ran were fairly sophisticated operations. For example, the East 55th Street operation was a very well-furnished three-bedroom apartment with a maid who served drinks from a very well-stocked liquor supply. And the girls employed there were professionals who also worked with other madams throughout the city. The services that were rendered uh, at this particular establishment, I think, could be described as somewhat bizarre. The minimum charge was $50, and Hollander kept a detailed set of books on her customers and expanded her business on the basis of referrals. Her customers were given business cards to identify her as an interior decorator, which they could then pass on to their friends, and their friends could use the card to gain admittance into her establishment. Her boyfriend, who we'll describe as Larry, she cultivated the friendship of a sergeant on the police force who apparently notified her of any impending police action against her that he, could, that he knew or could find out about. This sergeant retired from the force after testifying before the Knapp Commission in executive session. Hollander also employed a limousine chauffeur who passed money for her to individual policemen on various occasions. Early this year, the commission learned about Hollander and became aware of her payoffs to members of the police department. And that commission investigators visited Hollander and interviewed her con concerning these payoffs. The car in which she was taken away was later identified by the, by the license number as belonging to an officer rider, a plainclothesman from 4th Division, whom Hollander identified in the above interview as having led the raid. Approximately one month after Hollander's initial arrest, a New York City police officer met with an individual of her activities by the police officer of possible payoffs at the division, borough, and precinct level. And what I'd like to do now is play that tape A3. Uh, I'll give you my opinion. I don't think so. It, it's a possibility. You're fine. Can we do it for now? 
I think the, I think you could wrap the whole thing up. Oh, okay. Eight hundred and a thousand. Eight hundred and a thousand. Yeah. I got to have a little bit to work with, you know. Yeah. Look, I'm gonna offer. Well, you gotta have a little for yourself. We appreciate that. Well, listen. She said I got a hundred dollars a month for myself, right? All right. Somebody's so fine. Right. So I'm not gonna work for nothing, actually. So, but I got. You pick work. it up all the time. Yeah, I take care of it. She'll know who's gonna get it. And we make a phone call saying, hey, do we get your present to right. the old, uh, The whole deal with these people will be that if anything gets out there, there will be some sort of a code thing. They'll pick up the phone. You'll have the protection. That's it. I mean, they'll pick up the phone and say, as I keep using the name Purple, or yes, this is right. Purple, and that means for her, you know, it's going to be hot. Why don't you just pick up the phone so you can so say, what, what do you need this way? I have a few, I have a few phones to work with. Well, they might, their phones might be tattooed as a police officer. I'm not standing with two of police people. They don't go you uh, are not always tapped. <laughs> are you really? Shit, are you kidding? Who's in the tapper station as well? Uh, you, know, you know how many guys you have in internal security? I can I use them. Oh, 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 you mean internal security would tap the local cop and, and, and then Internal security is looking to catch us. Because, yeah, when I got made at the police officer, I made a call to I thought the, the NAP commission was inter like for internal security. Nothing to do, that's beside uh, our own security. Yep. Operations and getting her court case fixed through the arresting officer. Mr. T was again wired. During this conversation, excerpts of which we will play in a minute, the officer pointed out that if Hollander were convicted of a crime of moral turpitude, she would be subject to de deportation as an undesirable alien, and that the police were aware that her list of customers had been purchased from another madam. The officer then raised the ante from $1,000 to ten thousand dollars. That's for taking care of the court case. With respect to future operations, the protection was set at one thousand one hundred dollars per month, with a guarantee that nobody short of the chief inspector or the police commissioner would interfere. Out of the one thousand one hundred dollar monthly payment, officer uh, the officer was to keep a hundred dollars to himself. The rest was to be distributed among other officers. Now, I would like to make clear at this time that in evaluating these tapes, the Commission takes the position that the, what, what you hear on the tape with respect to the person who is speaking speaks for itself. As far as what he is saying about other people, that obviously has to be judged in the context of who's saying it and for what reason he's saying it. Um, we'd like to play now tapes A5 and A6. I thought the NAP commission was inter like for internal security. Nothing to do, that's beside his own security. Yep. So anyway, I would try to get the writer. I don't know how successful I'll be, I, I can't tell you. But I'll try to get someone who knows him. So sit down and we'll talk, listen. We want the case thrown out, what do you want? How much? Yeah. I don't know what's going to be. Dollars and cents, no, 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 nothing else. Can, you, do you want to take the contract? Oh no, that's all we can do. waiting for him. Mr. T paid the officer $500 and promised to pay an additional $600 shortly, and this amount would complete the initial monthly payment for the protection of the, uh, of the prostitution operation. This would be repeated every month thereafter. The officer promised to arrange for Mr. T to observe the payoff that he would make of the share of the money he received to other officers involved in the protection scheme. And in this conversation, uh, I'd like uh, A8.
to say, welcome, okay? I'm going to meet these guys here at 5.30. I'm going to get the guy the envelope. You can watch, I'm going to be right here. No, 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 look, I trust you. You've got to understand Terry, something. I'm, I'm Ted. I'm Terry. Ted. And what we want to know is that every month, she's going to get it, and she's going to get a call, like you said, the man from... Mr. White, Mr. From the White from Chicago. From Chicago. He's in town. Close it right up. doors. Forget about it. So these guys, they all have the same code. And you got to give me the third name on Friday, right? Right. Are you going to meet the three guys? Or, or just one? I want to meet one. Uh, two, I'm going to meet two guys in Friday. I'll give them a white envelope. So I'll have to meet you with the rest of the money before then? Yeah. But you'll, you'll be at the bar. You'll see that envelope. It's uh, See him again, see what you can do, because sent down she's not going for. I can tell you. Tell her, don't go for nothing. Don't go for And then you say, Jesus, you don't have to right? Uh, yeah, I know, but I, what do you want me to do? Make money is only money. You can make money. You can't make fucking time. Who have themselves engaged in corrupt activities and who will testify about them. They will testify about corruption that they have participated in, in such areas as gambling. This individual who stops has nothing to do with the matter as far as we know. <laughs> We're looking into it. No, that is Mr. T. The officer is obscured slightly by the, uh, by the pillar. The envelope is now in the hands of the officer. That's something else. I don't want to see you go. I hate to see you go. I want to make a few dollars on the fucking deal. But I guarantee you, I'll have my own money, that if he goes on a stand, she's out of the country. Is he that good to come? Testifying? He has got a 100% conviction rate on matters. How about that? If you want to check on that, you can have $1,000 on that. That's how sure I am with the people I'm doing business with. They're not bullshitting me. And I'm not here to bullshit you. When I was in a 17 squad, that was my fault. That was my headquarters. Well, here, as I will say, that was my headquarters. They wanted us to say, hey, they got a case. I'll be right there. I'm in here 12 years. 12 years? This is my... On a, and Clark's 12 years. I'm on a job 14 years. What you can do about getting this case fixed in court? We'll play uh, A10 and A11. Five hundred dollars, one thousand five hundred front money to show Ryder, and the balance after Hollander was set free. And that tape is A14. Yeah. Uh, shot of Mr. T and the officer walking together. We have the faces blocked out. This is, there they are walking. During one of the meetings that have been described. This is the building uh, down the street from the lawyer's office where they have just come, where the meeting took place. T has in his hands. And there is uh, the officer returning to the lawyer's office with the envelope in his hand. Uh, well, I'll get it after. And this is just another shot of the two. Uh, the officer on the left and Mr. T on the right walking uh, down towards the uh, the house of prostitution. Yes, I do. 
We got back from court. Mm -hmm. Tonight. Loaded. That one? The man is loaded. With what? Oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> Money. It's a paging system. Yeah. It's a paging system, Billy. Parlance tossed or patted down the uh, <clears throat> Mr. T as he came in and discovered the transmitting device on him. And at that time, Mr. T attempted to talk his way out of the situation, or at least long enough to give the agents time to get up and get him out. The agents stopped and got a police officer who was uh, on the street and brought him up with him and went in and. Uh, uh, took the took Mr. T out out with with them, leaving the police officer, uh, the original police officer, been involved in the deal, and the and the lawyer in the office. I think you might point out that incidental beneficiary of that happening was the motorist who was about to get a ticket. That's right. <laughs> uh, this is that uh, I described before, and the uh, the taking of of testimony. Oh, um, I, there are uh, there are transcripts of these tapes that are available. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, we've got a list uh, a list here. I think. Uh, how many do we have? We got about we got about 30 or 35 of them. So. During the interview, she admitted that she was operating a house of prostitution and described her experience with police payoffs. She stated that in early 1971, she had given $500 to the police sergeant mentioned above to be forwarded to a police lieutenant on the vice squad to avoid an impending arrest. She related other incidents involving payoffs and said she didn't mind paying the police for protection if she could get it. The reason for that remark was that apparently she wasn't getting it. One or two evenings prior to the interview, uh, her fortunes had turned. A plainclothesman from the 4th Division in mid-Manhattan visited her place and presented one of the business cards. Thinking that the plainclothesman was just another John, she arranged for him to get a girl and she accepted her portion of the payment. At that point, two other plainclothesmen entered and arrested her. This arrest was observed by commission investigators who were surveilling the apartment house at the time. The subject of the Knapp Commission is still police corruption, but what it boiled down today was politics. Specifically, did Mayor Lindsay or his administration know about widespread police corruption even three or four years ago? Two New York City policemen, David Dirk and Frank Serpico, say it's so. They've testified they told Lindsay officials about the corruption, but in return were told nothing was being done, first because of a potentially violent summer, and then because Lindsay was up for re-election. The question, of course, is it true? This business of priorities and how I understood priorities with uh, Jay Kriegel. Um, the sort of argument that I had with him in terms of priorities even extended to the recruitment program uh, that I was involved with in the sense that when I wanted to start this in the spring of 66, 
when before the city went on, on to hire 6,000. Well, does this have anything to do with the issue of, uh, of, of corruption? Uh, or does it just have to do with the, uh, with the recruitment program? It's nothing to do with recruitment program. I mean, we understand that, uh, that uh, Mr. Kriegel has priorities and has various uh, reasons for, for, uh, for deciding upon them, but I don't oh. think that it... That's up to you then, okay. Um, directing your attention, Sergeant Dirk, to May 29, 1967. Uh, did you have a meeting <clears throat> with uh, Commissioner Freeman in his office? Yes, I did. And uh, will you state what the conversation was, what you said to him, and what he said to you? Well, initially it involved a case I was working on, but it then stretched on in terms of a couple of hours. Commissioner Freeman was quite concerned about the uh, morale of the police squad in the office insofar as three detectives had just asked to be uh, transferred out. He was concerned as to why we were not making uh, police cases. He was concerned as to why people were not coming forward to us with information. And uh, what, did, uh, what did you say in response? Well, I told him that in terms of my understanding, the feeling of the squad was they uh, felt they were working on uh, rather um, uh, petty, petty things and the, the orientation of things was just uh, uh, quite upsetting. Uh, if you'd like, I can give you an example. Go ahead. It was that sort of thing that uh, upset the squad. And uh, you, were, you were telling this to uh, Commissioner Freeman. That's correct. And you outlined that specific instance among others to him. That's true. And <coughs> did you... Uh, Did you specifically... Do you want me to give you some more examples? Well, I'd like to direct your attention to the question of the treatment of informants. Uh, did you relate to him a particular instance uh, with, uh, with regard to the, the fact of, the, of your feeling that informants were not properly protected in the office? Well, in my particular case, I had... Uh, arrested an individual and uh, turned him and uh, he became an informant. I think he could have been productive and certainly would have been worth the effort in my judgment in terms of what he was alleging. Uh, made an allegation that uh, a certain judge was getting a certain amount of money in uh, gambling cases through a particular lawyer, he offered to take a gambling collar, be wired, have a conversation with uh, those lawyers. This whole thing was uh, aborted in a number of ways, but primarily because this informant was given up in open court by one of the attorneys of the Department of Investigation. When I complained to uh, the commissioner about it, he said, really didn't matter, it was just an informant. My point was that I had given my word to the informant that he would be protected. Well, you don't mean to imply in this, in, in, to say that the, the attorney uh, gave up the informant in order to abort your investigation. Oh, no, absolutely not. I think it was... Uh, in connection, I take it, with another case. No, I think it was simply a, a blunder. It was just as uh, simple as that. Well, whether it was a blunder or not, uh, it, did, did it occur in connection with the investigation that you were, that you're talking about, or was he an informant in another case? Well, no, in terms of that court appearance, that was in another case, yes. In other words, he was also an informant in another case, and in connection with that case, the lawyer uh, revealed his identity for whatever reasons he had in that case. And I think it was uh, accidental, sure. Right. And uh, the, you referred to this case that we've just been talking about, is that right? Where the informant's identity was inadvertently exposed. Yes. And what did uh, Commissioner Freeman uh, 
say in response to this suggestion? He promised me that uh, he would do that. <clears throat> Did he appear to be interested in, uh, in the prospect of meeting with uh, such, an, such an individual? Very much so. What did he say to you? Frank was uh, quite upset in that time in the sense that this was, uh, I believe, May 29th. I think on May 25th, his uh, prior partner had been transferred out and he had a new partner. In the course of their duties, they were using uh, Frank's car. I believe Frank told me that his new partner had made a pickup and had put the money in the glove compartment of Frank's car and indicated to Frank that uh, it would be safer in there than for him to be caught on his person. What Frank was concerned about, that it was his car, and what if it was discovered in his glove compartment? How could he possibly uh, explain it? He was concerned when it comes down to it in terms of the possibilities of his being uh, uh, set up. I told him that, uh, that things had changed and that we could go to Commissioner Freeman and uh, would he do so strictly on the basis of providing uh, the kind of information that he had and that the Department of Investigation would commence a real investigation in the 7th Division. What was his response? Uh, yes and no. We had another conversation the next uh, morning. This would be Memorial Day, uh, 1967. This, was, this took place at, uh, well, then later on in the afternoon, he came over to my house, and we talked about it. We talked, just reviewed the whole uh, situation. And we talked about it, and talked about it, and talked about it, and finally at uh, 7.30 that night, we met Commissioner Freeman in his apartment. Now, did you have any ground rules as to what you were going to discuss when you uh, went in to uh, see Commissioner Freeman? Yes. And what were those? It's my understanding that the ground rules that we had, we would not mention that we had uh, been to Kriegel, and we would not mention the $300 incident with Ferran. Why not in each case? Well. I just felt just the personal thing that uh, Commissioner Freeman would have been annoyed in terms of the uh, Kriegel and as far as uh, um, the Ferran matter is concerned, we wanted him to take some kind of action now and it was uh, my belief. Uh, that he would have been quite upset uh, to have learned about the other matter. In other words, well, telling him about Ferran would have got his mind off what you wanted him to think about. Yes. <clears throat> Why had you not problems? gone to him? Excuse me? Wouldn't it have created a problem for you to tell him the fact that you brought a man to his captain without telling him or reporting sure. it back later? Sure. So it was a personal concern, too. Right, absolutely. Well, th there wouldn't have been any problem with uh, with your bringing a, a police officer with a with a with a complaint to the head of the squad who was to investigate. What is frame about this? On a case, a sign painter, in the Department of Traffic allegedly it took two gallons of yellow traffic paint, and he had painted the side of his house. I've sent out to interview an 82-year-old senile man in Coney Island who is threatening to beat him up while I'm interviewing him. That got a big number and files and reports, but in terms of an approach of going into the building department, wired, soliciting architects, speaking to builders, the kind of things that you have done was absolutely and totally rejected by the office at that time. And this also applied to police cases. I don't know what to make it, how to make it any clearer. 
In other um, words, to have a convers conversation, Frank proceeded to give in very specific detail all the things that had happened to him in the uh, 7th Division and also including things that had happened to him in uh, uh, plain clothes that involved being informed the size of the uh, pad, how he was taken around supposedly to be introduced to gamblers, being in uh, an apartment and, and being asked to uh, um, count the uh, money, put it into uh, piles. This is pad money. The pad money. Uh, describe the situation of, of his concern in terms of the envelope or the, some of the pickups that had been done uh, using uh, his car. He indicated that uh, there was, he had actually seen and might have access to a, um, a list of um, pickup spots. He named names, prices. He was quite specific. At one point, when he was just starting in the uh, narrative and had told about the uh, introduction to uh, uh, the gamblers, uh, the commissioner said, that's just, you know, petty stuff, you know, get to the big stuff, and uh, Frank did. Now, did the, uh, the commissioner at this time take any notes, as far as you were aware? I really don't recall. You have no recollection one way or the other? Nope. <clears throat> was he sitting at a desk, do you remember? Was oh, no, no. We were sitting in uh, lounge chairs facing each other. I was sitting, uh, Frank was uh, sitting here, I was sitting here. I remember Frank was wearing a shoulder holster. Was there a desk available? I'm just trying to <clears throat> see if we can bring out whether he took notes or not. I don't, uh, I don't believe that, that there was any uh, other furniture between us. You don't remember seeing any paper in his hand one way? I remember he, uh, remember we had a drink, that's it. And uh, you're going to do this, and you're going to go out and get conversations for us. Uh, Frank turned to me, you know, what did you tell me? And uh, I dejected and tried to remind the commissioner of our conversation of the night before that Frank was coming here to give us information that we as the Department of Investigation would do an investigation based on the kind of information, the very specific information, this hard information that Frank was in fact uh, giving us. Commissioner Freeman pursued the idea and told Frank that it was his duty uh, to do as he was directed. Frank then said, look, you know, I'm a patrolman. You are the commissioner of investigation. You do the investigation. And that I am willing to cooperate, and I am giving you uh, this information. Uh, Sergeant Doug, there isn't any doubt in your mind that specifics were given to Commissioner Freeman at this meeting? Absolutely. We were there for about uh, two hours. Yes, Frank Serpico was willing to uh, try and get us this uh, list. June 1st was going to be the next day. Pickups were normally made at the beginning and uh, sometimes the middle of the month. He would supply us with the uh, locations of the pickup spots, of the names of uh, people who would be making pickups, of the uh, gamblers involved, uh, everything that he had related to me, he was prepared to cooperate with, with the only stipulation that he be not put in a position of uh, testifying one-on-one uh, -on -one in terms of uh, a wire. In terms of what? A, a wearing a wire. Well, that wouldn't have been a testifying one-on-one -on -one situation Probably. if he had a wire, would it? Right, well, right. Um, did he give any reason to uh, Commissioner Freeman why he was unwilling to
to wear a wire and following up the information that he had brought to him. Yes, he felt that in terms of his role, in terms of the unit that he was assigned in, it was my uh, belief for that uh, I think at one point Frank even indicated that, you know, if he were in the Department of Investigation, in other words, if that was his job, he wouldn't hesitate for a moment to wear well, a the wire. Well, fact, the fact that he would not hesitate if he were in the Department of Investigation to wear a wire does not explain why he would hesitate in his, uh, in the assignment he actually was in. What was the reason uh, for his uh, refusing to wear the wire? Well, I think in the other context, he would see it as part of his job, as part of a team. And whereas in this context, uh, frankly, in a certain sense, he's being used as an informant. And for that reason, he felt, did he express this to, uh, to Commissioner Freeman? Did he give Commissioner Freeman any really satisfactory reason why, as a police officer? It was certainly discussed that night, but I've had many conversations with Frank, and that certainly... <coughs> That's no, I'm not interested so much okay. in what, he's to what he told you. What I'm interested in is whether a uh, satisfactory reason was given to Commissioner Freeman. My best recollection that this sort of thing certainly was discussed, yes. What did Freeman say? Frank Serpico was angling for a, uh, for a promotion out of this uh, situation. Was that it? Well, I think his attitude more was like, uh, you're not going to bargain with me. Now, uh, did you have any discussions of alternative, alternative methods of gaining uh, electronic corroboration for the information that yes. uh, Frank Serpico had yes, brought did. in? Yes. What was that? Anything on phone taps? Uh, we talked about the phone tap, but Frank said that uh, nobody would talk on the phones because they assumed that the uh, phones were tapped. He, as I recall, he, in he indicated that the, one of the best spots would be the uh, surveillance truck of the 7th Division because while sitting in the surveillance truck inevitably the conversation would go around to, uh, talking about was who's on and who's off the uh, pad. What, uh, uh, would you describe what the surveillance truck was and what its function was? It was an unmarked uh, panel truck. Actually I've never seen the truck but uh, my understanding was the typical police surveillance truck is an unmarked uh, panel truck, it has uh, little holes drilled in it, or it has a uh, false uh, window. It's opaque on one side, but you can really see out from the in interior. And uh, what was, and then the, secondly, the, con the follow-up conversation, was he enthusiastic about the information that he was receiving? Yes. Well, it, he, did, he did not uh, express the view that it was routine or trivial? Certainly not compared to what we had been doing up to then in our office? No way could he have said that. Let me see if I understand your answers to Mr. Armstrong's questions sure. about plans for operation. When you left the apartment, you had, at least in your, in your mind, a plan of operation. Namely, you were going to get the bug or whatever, put in the truck, and follow the pickups of the beginning of the first month. Perhaps naively, we thought that Frank was going to bring the surveillance truck down. The next day, we would immediately install a bug, take it back up to the 7th Division, and uh, over here, all sorts of conversations. That was your plan as you left the home on Memorial Day? Yes, many holes were shot into it then in the, the morning. Then the uh, technical man blew that out of the water. That's right. And then, when you left Mr. the Commissioner's office the next day, you had no plan whatever? No, the plan was to try to, as I try recall, to persuade, to persuade uh, Frank uh, to either, you know, wear a... Um, yeah, and, but no alternative plan. Was discussed at that juncture? No. no that's, it. that's what I understood. What happened to the device? What the end of that conversation was, whether he would in fact try it or not. Then you subsequently read on the subject of what was to be done with the information which he had received from Officer Serpico. Yes. How many times and over what period of time? Um, initially, 
the next day, I think, or even, uh, yeah, it was the next uh, day insofar as this was June 1 and June 2, and that if we were going to make any observations, and so far as what we did have from Frank, device or no device, was more than we had ever had before. In other words, Frank could detail, pick up spots where there might be opportunities for surveillance, uh, names, identifications, uh, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, Commissioner Freeman's refused to uh, discuss it. Eventually, literally refused to is in a colorful fashion that at some time or other when he chose to indicate that he didn't want to answer a question, he would in effect turn his back on you. Yes, in that manner, All yes. Right. Now, Are you saying that's what happened at this moment? As I recall, yes. In other words, you went back to him and said, well, we have the locations. Why don't we see what we can do about it? Why don't them? we at least send a couple of people up and see what's there and see if there's anything that we could uh, observe. In other words, if we had had, if we had come by this information in terms of an anonymous letter um, to the office, that would have been standard procedure to go out, you know, that sort of approach, send a team up and try to make... Keep your, keep your closer to the mics. Uh, to send a team up and see if it was possible to make any sort of observations. It came in the outside, uh, Pardon me? Do you wanted to treat it as though it had come in from the outside, never mind well, separate though? No, at least give it the same attention that we would have given to an anonymous uh, allegation. Did he not make any response? He just turned his back on you? Or did he, did he say, no, I won't do it until he wears a wire? No, he never said, no, I won't do it. What he said was that... Uh, what did he say? Uh, I don't recall, but it was a dismissal, like it just was not to be discussed uh, anymore. Well, the point I was driving at is, did... Uh, did you ever receive in words from him a response to the requests that you made to uh, to uh, to investigate the thing? Never. Now what were you telling Serpico all this time as to what was happening to the investigation that was supposed to be proceeding in the Department of Investigation? When I went back to see Serpico, I didn't know what to tell Serpico because we had just gone through so much just to get him to talk to Commissioner Freeman. And I was embarrassed to put it mildly, and I thought I'd try to stall Serpico in the hope that I might persuade Commissioner Freeman to change his mind. In the end, Serpico said to me, sure, Dirk. What did he say? I didn't get that. Sure, Dirk. Frank uh, said it in a very cynical way, and apparently rightly so. Did you, uh, did you tell shortly thereafter? And did you tell him the whole, the whole incident? Yes. And including the reference? Disbelief. Disbelief? Yes, sir, because, I'm sorry. Jay Kriegel, I asked Jay, I mean, uh, didn't you believe what he was telling you? I mean, did you think he was a psycho? And uh, Jay said that, uh, you know, certainly not. Uh, he liked, uh, he liked Frank. You mean disbelief? What? Not disbelief of Serpico, that, but disbelief. That Serpico was absolutely in, in Kriegel's words to me that Serpico was absolutely not a psycho. And he disbelieved your statement that uh, Freeman called him a psycho? Oh, no. He didn't believe my what did, description. What did he disbelieve? No, he, no I, I said when I came back and told him what uh, Freeman had said, it was just uh, out of disbelief. He couldn't, you know, conceive of that. Well, disbelief isn't really what you meant, just amazement. Yes, amazement. I'd like to direct your attention now, <clears throat> Sergeant Dirk. Come on. They knew all about it. Mm hmm Now, uh, you're right. Question you about it? No. He just said, uh, <coughs> 
you know, is this for real? And I said, uh, look, this is what we've been talking about um, all along. Well, what did he mean, is this for real? Because uh, uh, if your testimony is correct, as you say, you had been talking about it for quite some time. Well, was, was there anything on this memorandum that you hadn't spoken to him about before? Not that I can think of. Mm -hmm. and simply saying that there should be an investigation in terms of all these stories, that the Department of Investigation was not doing it, that as far as I knew, the police department was not doing it. And that's really what it's all about. In other words, it like preceded you by a couple of years. Uh, it, it, in other words, what you w would have wanted would have been some kind of an investigation at that time? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you felt that this memorandum provided the basis for giving, uh, well, summarizing the well, things that you had talked to, well, to Kriegel about? Certainly that some questions sh should be asked at the highest level, especially in the, you know, this ongoing thing with Frank, this hard going thing in terms of uh, not hearing from uh, Commissioner Walsh. Okay. And especially is, uh, is you. This. Right. Well, it would be fair to say, Sergeant so Dirk, that this memorandum contains uh, a, a gossip plus some specific facts you got from Serpico, plus your own interpolations as to what the situation was based upon your analysis of what you have been told. Uh, and does not. Is there any particular reason why? You couldn't have been introduced to these people and gotten the information and transmitted it without revealing the fact that it had come through him. I, uh, the words seem to fit together. I can't make a situation out of that, uh, Council. I mean, this is David told me how difficult it was for him to persuade these guys, hey, the, how they were coming in on his good faith, and he'd have to twist their arms. It was his word of honor, and that he was their only protection, and I had to protect his his relationship with them, and not. My only dealings was with David, and he was very firm on those conditions. And since he was firm on the conditions, you did not press it to try and get the uh, uh, try and get the information by persuading him that you, you that his name could be kept out of it. What I'm not clear on is just exactly what this condition represented. Was it a rep what, was it a, an attempt on Dirk's part to keep his name out of the situation? He, David Dirk did not have any interest in getting information through me back to the police department for verification or investigation. That wasn't something he wanted to discuss. His mind was made up. Beginning around the, uh, by the time of uh, late May of 67, the summer of 67, David is uh, persuaded that what's needed is, uh, is one of two things, either uh, to sweep out the whole top team of the department because they weren't going to do anything, or uh, launch an independent probe at the police department. And those are the only things he was prepared to talk about. Did he suggest specifically launching at least an, to independent, me, the, an independent probe of the police department? Uh, many times. <coughs> Did you discuss it with him as a realistic alternative? Did I discuss it with him as a real? Well, he thought it was a realistic alternative. Yeah. Did you? No. Why not? I had no basis to go on. Didn't have any any uh, 
hard evidence uh, that he was prepared to let us verify that would indicate uh, uh, grounds for taking a step that drastic. And I think it is a drastic step. Well, let's, uh, let's get for a moment to the evidence that you, that you did have. Did you discuss specifics of corruption or allegations of corruption with David Dirk prior to meeting Frank Serpico? Did he talk to you about Serpico's experiences up to that date and describe sure. to you what had been going on? Sure. He uh, was always, uh, I, it's very hard for me uh, uh, to remember, for example, a, a lot of what Frank Serpico said because I had heard a good part of it before and after from David again. A lot of, a lot of what he told me was what he had heard from other people, including Frank. And, and what do you recall uh, hearing from, from Dirk at that time? I mean, what kind of specific? Of an organized pad in, in, in that was uh, here and we discussed that. That was a, uh, we talked about collusive arrests. Um, Plain clothesman uh, was tested when he moved first into a unit uh, as to whether or not he could be trusted by uh, his colleagues. Those are the kinds of things I recall from David's prior discussions and from my meeting with uh, David and Frank. Only time I met him. Ever? Ever? Seen. Only face to face meeting I've ever had with Frank, yeah. I don't recall specifically the names of officers or the dates that we used. I, I, Frank talked about his first hand experience, and I assume that it included that, yeah. Right. I mean, I'm not asking you whether you now remember the names uh, and dates. I'm just saying whether you remember that the names and dates were used at that time. Yes. And, uh, this was the or not. Does that uh, conform with your recollection? That's, uh, that's Mr. Dirk's testimony, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I, he said he asked me to discreetly check whether it would, was under investigation, but to do that without talking to the police commissioner or the first deputy. Right. Now, I, I don't understand what that means. That sounds Im impossible to me. Well, only way I can, it, 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 the only way I could possibly verify whether an investigation was going on was to make inquiry of the police commission, the first deputy of the commission investigation, all of which was clearly prohibited by the ground rules of the meeting. Well, David wanted a meeting with the mayor after that with a group of officers like Frank. That was, that was the point of the meeting. Well, he thought that proved that we ought to have a, a meeting with the mayor and that ought to result in an independent investigation to the police department. He told me specifically not to check it. He told me specifically not to let it get back to the police commissioner, the first deputy, or Commissioner Freeman, that they had been to see me. Was, it, was there any discussion at that meeting about, the, in the event that something could be done about that situation, getting certain uh, transfer? My, uh, my recollection is that came up later. I don't, it, it's possible it was discussed, and I don't think that Frank was ever a participant in a discussion about his transfer. Uh, David did talk to me several times about that uh, uh, subsequently to that meeting. His I think the restriction's to, perfectly clear, and I think they've reaffirmed it in their testimony. Specifically, were you under the understanding that you were not to talk to the first deputy or the police commissioner at all on the subject, or that you were simply to try and keep Mr. Dirk and Mr. Serpico's identity a secret? I, that was not a real. That was not a real distinction to me. I was not. I did not, have, did not have the practice of calling the first deputy police commissioner and inquiring about his investigation into police corruption. How about the chief inspector? And inquiring about the corruption Carolyn. investigations? Absolutely not. How often did you see him? Uh, some frequency during that, that entire period of time, the same as the commissioner. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was your relationship with, uh, with Chief Garlick uh, uh, closer on a more frequent basis than, uh, than uh, with, for instance, the police commissioner? I, I wouldn't characterize it as such. Unless I didn't, unless I, unless I resisted revealing it, and then I'm, I'm uh, in a very uncomfortable position, I think. You did inquire specifically about the 7th Division, which as I understand it, uh, Frank Serpico was the source of that into the business department. Mm -hmm. They would have had to know that Frank Serpico was the person to come Well, they might have, but they certainly would have, the commissioner certainly would have asked me where did I get the information. I've got an obligation to go forward and, and give him the name of the person who told me that. 
Why would you have an obligation to go forward and give him the name? That was greater than the obligation to go forward and give him the information in the well, first place. Well, I think place. the commission has a right, when I come to him with a complaint mm -hmm. about the performance of his department, to ask me where I got it from. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think that the commissioner would rather have the information on an anonymous basis uh, than uh, not have it at all? I am not an anonymous basis. Well, if you could testify that he already had the information. The first deputy had the information. But to your knowledge, you didn't know whether the police commissioner had it, and in fact, he's testified that he did not. I had no knowledge of that. I can speak for David Dirk much more clearly uh, uh, than uh, Frank Serpico, and I spoke to David about this many times subsequently, that uh, David's purpose at that time was to give us convey to us his sense that uh, corruption was widespread, that, not, that uh, he was dissatisfied with the top command, and that he wanted, uh, uh, beginning uh, around the beginning of the summer of 67, right around the time of this meeting, I would guess, shortly thereafter, that he thought uh, we ought to either uh, have a new top command of the police department or an independent investigation. Well, it had already been reported to the police department. He didn't ask, come to me. I, I was clearly prohibited from doing that. Back to the police department with the mayor? Yes. And how frequently did you do that? Well, I have no idea of how frequently, and it wasn't infrequently. But at what level do these uh, discussions uh, take place? Did you discuss broad policy questions with respect to the department? Yes, and his uh, concern for it. During the course of those discussions, did you uh, discuss the issue of corruption in the department? Yes. And how often did you do that? Well, uh, the same frequency as uh, we talked about the uh, problems of uh, corruption generally. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when did you first become aware of that uh, of, uh, of that investigation? Or uh, I believe uh, October the 9th, uh, 1967. Now, was that the first you had heard of any allegations involving corruption in that particular division, the situation? Yes. Now, uh, could you just uh, say who Chief McGovern was at that? Of uh, a corrupt condition uh, in the Bronx involving uh, police personnel. Do you recall any of the, uh, any of the details? I don't now? recall any of the details, and we didn't go into great detail. Object. Yes, at, uh, when at a later happen? date, uh, I don't have. Did he mention the uh, way in which this investigation came about? Did he mention the fact uh, of a police officer named Frank Serpico? who was actually in the division and who was supplying information to help the investigation? I uh, have difficulty in recollecting exactly what he said in that regard. Uh, uh, he did say something to the effect that, uh, that the man working there, in the sense that it was Serpico, uh, should remain there and uh, because he was already assigned and uh, he was the perfect person, in a sense, uh, uh, to continue and participate in the investigation. He uh, mentioned, did he not, uh, his inability to bring him into his own unit? Into, uh... Well, that would only uh, uh, strengthen uh, uh, the suspicions of the police personnel that uh, that Serpico was working for uh, uh, headquarters operation and such. And we didn't think at that time, and I agreed with him, that we should do anything that would disturb uh, what was uh, just occurring, and if you'd like to use the term, naturally. He, uh, well then, the existence of Frank Serpico and his role in this investigation necessarily came up in the course of this conversation. Yes, that there was a police officer present and who would come forward with information. Et cetera. 
Uh, I'm not suggesting that you would remember the name. I couldn't say that I do remember the name, and I couldn't say that I didn't. The, that it wasn't recalled to me. I wasn't suggesting that you uh, that you might. I was just uh, trying to make clear the fact that the commissioner did point out to you the fact that there was a, in effect, an undercover man there feeding information back from the seventh division. Yes, I would assume that that was, in substance, what he said. Now, at that time, uh, in your discussions with uh, Commissioner Walsh, did he outline to you the potential scope of this investigation? No. How many plainclothesmen might be involved? For no, that? not at that time. Was there any thought as to how high up the corruption might go? No. Well, in the light of the fact that there were people in the 7th Division uh, running the investigation, was, a, was there any consideration as to whether it might not be appropriate for people in a command position in the division who might themselves be involved to be in a position of uh, well, investigating the matter? Well, parenthetically, you have to begin by trusting people, uh, whether you're trusting the first man that works for you or whether you're trusting the policeman on the street who you don't know by name. Uh, it appears that, and was true, that all the men who were in charge of that investigation, the Pronk Division, were held in the highest esteem by Mr. Walsh and Mr. McGovern, and also by the department as to their integrity and to their competency. Now, were you aware either from well, let me continue. How many more times did you discuss this matter with uh, Walsh or McGovern or anyone else in the department? What? I might have had just a, uh, a very brief uh, conversation with uh, Chief McGovern, and uh, it wasn't on, the, on any formal basis. That is, it, I didn't call him in to ask him about it. Uh, I had any number and continuously had conversations with John Walsh about many things and about many uh, internal security investigations. You're sure of that? You have a positive I'm recollection? Positive, I'm positive of that. How many times during that period of time, let's say from, uh, from the early part of 1967 through October, uh, how many times did you discuss the issue of police corruption with the mayor, to your knowledge? I have a very uh, a distinct recollection of having a meeting with the mayor in the living room of Gracie Mansion <clears throat> with Mr. Garlick. Now, Mr. you're referring to Sanford Garlick, who That's was then right, chief who inspector. Who was then chief inspector. And the uh, subject of the meeting uh, was uh, police corruption. And it was a, ven a very general uh, conversation with absolutely no specifics. Can you describe as best you can what those generalities consisted of? Uh, 